Hi, everyone, and welcome to our online platform series where we're going to be continuing the theme of intellectual property issues. Um, throughout this series, we've looked at various IP issues, including a conversation between our colleagues, John McKenzie and Rudy Leishman, and an advocate, Andrew McWhirter, comparing the patent litigation um, process in Scotland and in England and Wales. Today, we're going to be focusing on the issues that can arise when promoting your brand online. And we're going to be working um, through some of the issues around uh, influencers and how those relationships can be managed successfully so you can hopefully avoid disputes when promoting products. Before we start our conversation today, just a few small housekeeping points to go through. Um, firstly, to keep background noise down, we've placed all of you on mute. Um, you are going to be able to ask up any questions throughout the presentation today. And if you do have any questions, just feel free to stick them in the question and answer function that you should see at the bottom of your screens. And what we'll do is we'll pick them up as we go through the presentation and answer them at the end. Um, just introductions first. Um, my name is Matt Phillip. I'm a partner in the Commercial Disputes team, and I'm joined today by Carly Duckett, a solicitor in our Commercial Disputes team, and Sarah Rafiq, a solicitor in the Media and Technology team. Um, we deal with a lot of different types of brand protection issues, and over the last few years, one of the things we've seen an increase in is the number of questions from clients about advertising online, and in particular, um, their relationships with influencers. So, Today, we're going to look at some of the common issues that we've seen from those discussions, and particularly when it comes to managing relationships with influencers, and also some of the copyright issues that can arise on social media platforms. Saira is going to kick off today's session by summarizing some of the development of influencer advertising, just to try to put this in context. And then Carly's gonna look at the extent to which images posted online are protected by copyright. We're then going to go on and talk about how you can use contracts to manage your brand's image and relationships. And then we're going to cover some of the provisions that are often included in those agreements with influencers, which might differ from some of the other contractual provisions that you've seen. And then we're going to wrap up by just looking at some of the potential risks um, to your brand's reputation if you're faced with a copyright infringement or a breach of contract claim. Hello. So, in the past, brands would have focused their marketing in print media, radio and television advertising. To get the brand's image in front of large audiences, those brands would have had to pitch to and pay um, then, um, sometimes a lot of money to broadcasters and publishers. However, the rise of smartphones and social media has revolutionised the way brands market their products. Social media has also transformed the way brands reach their target customers. They can create social media accounts over which they have complete control, allowing them to showcase their brand as they wish. Brands are also able to take advantage of influencers and social media users posting about their products at their own volition. This free advertising allows for greater um, engagement since the brand gets the benefit of the product reaching the influencers or the social media users' followers. Social media platforms have enabled anyone to turn their profile into a profitable advertising space. Some social media users have made a career out of posting product reviews both independently and on behalf of brands as a endorsement. For anyone unfamiliar, <coughs> excuse me, for anyone unfamiliar with the term influencer or content creator, they tend to be individuals who have a substantial following on social media platforms. Brands can benefit from working with these influencers or the content creators and more traditional sellers in the same way as it allows them to benefit from and engage with a wider social media following. It has been widely reported that Kylie Jenner can charge just shy of $1 million for one post on her Instagram profile. Kylie Jenner has around 223 million followers and her profile has a global reach which makes securing a post from her profile extremely attractive to many brands. Brands can essentially pick influencers that align with their image and values and work with them to endorse the brand's products to its followers. The influencer-follower relationship has a different dynamic to traditional advertising 
because it feels more personal. Followers can feel like they know the person they're following, which makes working with influencers a powerful marketing strategy for brands. But there are risks that, that are associated with those relationships, including potential breaches of copyright, non-compliance with advertising standards, breaches of contract, the impact of damaged relationships, and potential reputational repercussions. Carly is going to start by talking about copyright protection and then move on to advertising standards and the regulatory framework after that. So copyright offers you a way to protect your intellectual property rights without having to make an application to the intellectual property office or any other body for that protection. And the protection afforded to works protected by copyright is considerably longer than that for trademarks or patents subject to re-registration. The length of protection depends on the kind of work in question, but for author works, which are original literary, dramatic, musical and artistic works, as well as films, the copyright period is tied to the lifetime of the author, plus 70 years. So for brands, it's unlikely that the copyright will have expired in digital images that you want to use, and that period is the same for all countries in the EU. The author is usually the first owner of the copyright in the work. And it's worth bearing in mind that copyright protects the expression of an idea rather than the idea itself. So if you've discussed a concept for an image with someone and then they create the image before you, they will own the copyright in their image. And generally speaking, songwriters can own the rights to their lyrics, authors own the rights to their written work, and influencers own the rights to the images they take and post online without having to register those rights. But the creator doesn't always own the copyright because they can assign their rights to third parties. And a common example of this is where work is created in the course of employment. In those circumstances, the employer will own the copyright unless the employer and employee have a separate agreement that confirms the employee retains the copyright in anything they produce. But if someone's under a contract for services, they usually retain the copyright in anything they produce unless there's a contractual agreement that says otherwise. If the right is assigned, then the previous owner gives the whole right to the new owner but copyright owners can also act, license their rights to others, um, which allows them to use their images. And that's often done for a fee. And assuming the licensors negotiated the terms of the license, they can use that license to control the way any licensee uses their work, including when that expires. If you're familiar with the Top Gun film franchise, the original movie was based on an article by an Israeli writer called Eid Yone, which was named Top Guns. And the film was then produced by the studio Paramount Pictures, which had reportedly obtained a license to adapt the article into a film in the 1980s. The writer's family have claimed that in January 2018, they put Paramount on notice that they were terminating the license and that it would expire in 2020. Paramount Pictures had been in production of the sequel, Top Gun Maverick, in 2018, but filming was postponed due to the pandemic. So production continued into 2021 and the film was ultimately released in 2022. It's since been reported that the Yone family are claiming damages against Paramount Pictures because production of the Top Gun sequel concluded after the copyright license expired. And I think this is a really helpful example of the way you can use a license to promote your work, to increase exposure and to monetize your rights, but also of what can go wrong if you aren't careful in ensuring you've complied with the terms of your license. When we're thinking about these issues in the context of social media, it's also really important to think about the terms and conditions of each platform. For example, Instagram's terms of use state that as part of your agreement with them, so consenting to their T's and C's when you download the app and create an account, you give Instagram the permissions they need to provide the service, which includes granting Instagram a license to use your work, which means the posts that you make on that app. The terms of that license are that you grant Instagram a non-exclusive, royalty-free, transferable, sub-licensable, worldwide license to host, use, distribute, modify, run, copy, publicly perform or display, translate and create derivative works of your content, which are consistent with your privacy and application settings. So the license you're granting to Instagram is really broad, but they do accept that the license ends when the content is deleted from their systems which you can do by either deleting the post from your profile or by deleting your profile entirely. 
In a world where there's an increased drive by brands to reach new customers, by working with influencers to promote their goods and services, it's important that brands are aware of their rights, the rights they're granting to third parties, how they can commercially exploit those rights, and to understand the rights of those they're working with. Brands should also be alive to the risks that come with using protected works without the authority of the author or the owner of the copyright. So you might be part of an organisation that promotes products or services using a website, social media accounts or other means of advertising. And on all of those platforms, it's likely that you'll be using images, text or videos that are protected by copyright. If you've produced those images, you can then use them to promote your brand on those online platforms or in print media. But when advertising in print media and on television adverts was more common, it would have been more difficult to copy other people's works. But now any text and images on your online platforms can easily be copied, particularly by screenshots that can be taken on phones, laptops and tablets. And it's then easy for others to repost your content without your consent or knowledge. And it's easy for you to repost others' content without their permission. OK, so it sounds like basically what we have is a situation where the law that relates to copyright, which isn't necessarily straightforward in and of itself, applies in an environment where it's even easier to copy someone else's work. So against that backdrop, are there any key points that we need to focus on in order to make sure that you stay on the right side of the line? So social media platforms often have their own copyright policies which is a useful starting point for any user is to find out what their rights are. However, these policies tend to be really high level, so we would always recommend that you seek legal advice if you are in any doubt. Instagram's terms of use state, to paraphrase, you can't do anything that violates someone else's rights, including intellectual property rights. You may use someone else's works under exceptions or limitations to copyright and related rights under applicable law. Now, these terms are broadly drafted, which makes it hard for users to understand exactly what they can and can't do, and it's difficult to put the terms into context. Instagram has a separate copyright document available to its users, <coughs> excuse me, which puts the terms in plain language, explaining that the best way to help make sure that what you post to Instagram doesn't violate copyright law is to only post content that you've created yourself. Facebook's policy has identical wording. That guidance is clear, but it's easier said than done. To assist users in then assessing whether they have the right to post content on Instagram or Facebook, both policies are in questions that users should ask themselves before posting. So the first one is, have I created all of the content myself? Secondly, do I have permission to use all of the content included in my posts? Number three, does my use of the content fall within it, um, an exception to copyright infringement? And lastly, is the content protected by copyright? So for example, is it a short phrase, idea, or a public domain work? Now, if you have an understanding of copyright law, then you can probably follow these questions and make an informed decision. But it is, un it, it is unlikely that every, that every Instagram user is following this, this, exact, um, this exact thought process before posting. It is therefore important that brands and, and then the influencers are aware of these terms of use as well as the regulations for non-broadcast advertising that Matt is now going to discuss. So another risk area to keep in mind if you've uh, sent an influencer or product to try, for example, is that they need to comply with advertising standards and the CAP code um, if they do post about that product on social media. The Advertising Standards Agency is the regulatory body for advertising in the UK. And it deals with complaints arising from adverts in the press, on radio, TV and cinema, on the internet, and smartphones, tablets, emails, texts, uh, messages, billboards and many other places. Um, the ASA also monitors adverts to check that they're compliant with the UK's regulatory framework for advertising and it can take action to ban ads that are misleading. 
The ASA also works closely um, with the Committee of Advertising Practice, CAP, on various initiatives. And the groups work together to make sure that brands advertise responsibly within the UK. They can also work closely with the Competition and Markets Authority, um, which works to ensure that consumers get a good deal when buying goods and services by enforcing competition law and conducting investigations in the market. As part of the remit, the ASA monitors the activity of influencers to ensure that they're also complying with the CAP code. If influencers are routinely failing to comply with the, routine, the regulatory obligations, then the ASA can place them on a list of uh, non-compliant social media influencers. In 2018, the ASA published the Influencers Guide to help everyone involved in the influencer marketing space understand the rules that apply to them and to try to encourage them to follow those rules. The guide explains what is expected of influencers under the UK code of non-broadcast advertising and direct promotional marketing, also known as the CAP code. Um, and in really simple terms, the guide tries to make clear that an influencer must declare that their post is an advert when they've received payment. Payment and the definition of payment includes not just any form of monetary payment, but also, and importantly for present purposes, any commission, um, a free loan of a product or services, for example, the loan of a car for a few days, a free product or service, um, whether requested or received as an unprompted gift or any other incentive. So that means if you invite an influencer to attend an event you're hosting, you send them a box of products or you invite them on a PR trip, they're going to need to declare on all posts associated with those events and products um, that the posts are adverts. The same applies to affiliate codes or links that the influencers might post with your products, even if they bought the product themselves. So if, for example, the influencer purchases your product and contacts you to request a discount code for them to then share with their followers, and as a result of that, they receive a commission, they're then required to declare that the post's an advert. Um, and to use that as an example, um, if an influencer doesn't get any commission from the discount code, then if they pass that benefit onto the end user, then the post isn't going to be considered an advert and doesn't need to be labeled as such. Um, so just in short, if there's some sort of payment or personal incentive for the post, it's likely to be in scope for the CAP code. The CAP code also makes it clear that adverts must be obviously identifiable as such. And as an aside, the CMA also shares that view and has separately advised that adverts need to be clearly identifiable to be compliant with consumer law. So that means that consumers need to be able to recognize that something is an advert without having to interact with the advert itself. So they shouldn't need to search for a declaration on the post or click through to an affiliate link to discover that the influencer is making a commission on that post. The CAP code also recognises that it can be difficult for influencers to make sponsored posts obvious on their social media profiles because influencer marketing often appears alongside other organic content and unless the brand requests otherwise, it can quite often be presented in a very similar format to that organic content. And this can make it difficult for a consumer to understand when something is actually an advert. CAP has stated that the absolute minimum that would be expected is an upfront label on the post to confirm that it's an ad. I've definitely noticed trends with this among influencers that I follow myself, and some seem to take their obligations under the CAP code really seriously, and increasingly those influencers will preface their story posts on Instagram with a blank screen declaring that the post to follow are adverts, or they'll dub that series of story posts as an ad break, but that isn't the approach taken across the board and others sometimes try to conceal their hashtag ad in the background of images so that you really have to pay attention to the image to establish whether that person has received the product for free or has been paid to post about it. The wording influencers use is really important and um, the ASA and CMA have advised that using labels that are understandable for customers is really important. They suggest ad, advert, advertising and advertisement and following research that the ASA has conducted they've found that social media users struggle to identify when an influencer's post is an advert so the CAP guidance suggests avoiding using phrases like thanks to such and such brand for making this possible sponsored or gifted 
because it's not immediately clear from those phrases that the post is an advert. And previously, I found myself wondering whether something is an advert, and that's really not the position that you should leave your followers in. This is something brands need to be alive to because CAP has confirmed that the obligation to ensure an advert is clear extends to the brand and any agents involved in creating and publishing the content. But it's worth pointing out that if you have a brand account, then you don't need to declare that everything you are posting is advertising your product. CAP have acknowledged that people are generally aware that brands will be advertising their own products on their own social media platforms. Now, um, alongside the regulatory framework, sorry, for um, advertising, brands need to also be aware of other rules that apply to the promotion of their products. So, for example, thinking about the target audience for advertising on age restricted products like alcohol, machinery, or products that are subject to additional regulatory requirements like supplements, food, or medical devices. Medical devices, um, for example, they have a completely um, a different rule for marketing both to consumers and to healthcare professionals. Now, this is because marketing materials for consumers must be prepared with a sense of responsibility to the consumer. As such, there are strict consumer marketing rules that brands must follow. The CAP code ensures that advertising medical devices in the UK receive the necessary high level of scrutiny. The CAP code stipulates that objective claims must be backed by evidence. Furthermore, if any medical professional shares that advert, they will need to hold all relevant credentials to show that they are a suitably qualified health professional to make those claims. They must also be able to, to substantiate the claims made. More recently, on Monday, it was reported that Kim Kardashian has, has agreed to pay $1.26 million for failing to disclose that she was paid $250,000 to publish and to publish a, the Instagram post promoting a crypto asset. The SEC found that she had violated federal security laws. Now, whilst this is a US example, authorities in the UK have signaled that they are willing to take similar action. Based on the attendee list today, I think this issue is something to think about if you are intending to advertise in this way. The people you are working with may not understand the additional requirements that you have. And so one of the things that we have found useful is, is preparing a simple guide that explains what needs to be included in any post to make sure that they comply with regulatory restrictions. When brands are deciding which influencers to work with, it's always important that the influencer not only has a strong following, but that the personal brand and image fit with the product. Um, for example, bakers promoting cooking utensils, doctors promoting supplements, and bartenders promoting our alcohol. Um, brands should do their due diligence on the influencers they're working with to ensure that they're happy to be affiliated with that person. Um, and often that includes reviewing the posts that they've created in the past across their portfolio of social media platforms. That's particularly important where the brand has no control over what that person might post now or in the future, and they can't oblige them to delete anything that's potentially damaging that they've posted in their past. There's a greater risk for brands when they send products to influencers without any contractual relationship to govern that process. The benefit of having a contract in place is that the brand and the influencer both understand what's expected of them. And with the value of the ad campaign, it's important for both parties to understand what each other's rights are. I can think of countless examples of athletes losing endorsement deals because of the moral clauses that are included in their contracts with brands. And that's a well-recognized and well-understood approach, particularly when it comes to high-profile sponsorship deals. One of the issues with social media and with influencers is that the relationship often develops organically over time. And so quite often there isn't a formal contract in place that contains this sort of clause. And the other issue is that particularly towards the micro-influencer end of the spectrum, it wouldn't seem uh, proportionate to ask them to sign a long-form agreement to deal with this type of issue. It's also important that brands monitor that influencer closely once they start to build that relationship 
that's with them to make sure that the person continues to align with the brand's image and their values. If that position changes, it's going to be really beneficial for the brand to have a contract in place that makes clear the circumstances in which the brand can terminate the relationship with the influencer and what the practical effect of that termination is likely to be. So, for example, a requirement that the influencer deletes the brand's ads from their profile, um, which can help distance the brand from that uh, person if the relationship sours. So we typically deal with things when they become contentious. Um, Syrah deals with that process of trying to make sure the contracts are in place. And Syrah, I guess the question is, are there any particular issues that you think brands should be thinking about when they're drafting those contracts with influencers? That's a good question. And I think it's important to ensure that when you're drafting those contracts, it contains key provisions to ensure that the brand's reputation is protected and parties have clarity um, on their rights. So um, I'm going to discuss um, a few of these key provisions that we would normally look to include in these types of agreements. So the services that the influencer will provide is a good place to start. This will set out what the influencer is promoting. So this would be the then product and the provision of, of the product to the influencer by the company. This may also include a, a requirement to ensure that their biography on all of their social media accounts accurately reflects their association with the company and how the company expects the, um, the advert to be delivered on which social media platforms will it be Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, for example. And then another provision to consider is whether there would be any control by the company over the influencer's content. So, for example, will the company review the post prior to the influencer posting it? Is it the case that the influencer can simply push it live and then send the link to the company? Or does it need to be sent through a particular system in advance for review and approval? What about the frequency of the online posts? There are, there are then as some companies who have been known to go so far as stating what time the post must be shared for maximum engagement. So um, an example of this is Scott Disick, who is promoting booty. And in a rush to post the promoted product, Scott made a mistake of copying and pasting the instructions word for word that he had received from booty into the posts. And then um, another key provision and one that we have discussed is legal compliance. The, the um, agreement should always require the influencer to perform the services in accordance with the CAP code and the CMA guidance that we have already discussed. We would also suggest that this clause requires the influencer to comply with the company's social media guideline. You should always have a social media guideline and you should ensure that the influencer follows them. Um, and then moving on, exclusivity is another, key, is another key provision, ensuring that the influencer is not working with any of the brands um, then, um, the competition. As such, we would normally advise that we include a clause prohibiting the influencer from providing any services to any party with a competing product. Now, you are working with a influencer because you want to enhance your brand, but sometimes you can fall into a trap. When you engage with an um, the influencer, you do so because of who they are. So you will want to make sure that they are consistent in how they portray themselves on the social media account. We would therefore normally include some basic behavior frameworks, such as not making any disparaging comments relating to the company or the product that they are promoting and not doing anything to prejudice the goodwill or the reputation of the company or the product. As we have already discussed, there are also intellectual property rights which attach to social media advertising. It is therefore important to then include provisions for the ownership of those intellectual property rights with regards to the product that the influencer is endorsing. There are three key points to consider here. First of all, 
the influencer should not use someone else's content either deliberately or by mistake. Secondly, the company owns whatever the outputs are. And third, the company retains the rights to use the influencer's image. Um, another key provision and one that we see in all contracts is termination. So upon the termination of the agreement, the company may not want the influencer to have any references to the company's materials once the agreement has been terminated. In this instance, we would include a clause which requires the influencer to remove all references to the company and the materials from their social media profiles. The next pr provision would relate to whether you're happy for the influencer to remove any content early. So this would be in advance of the termination of the agreement. If not, this has to be covered in the agreement also. And also, like, like any other contract, payment is another key provision. You need to consider how the influencer will get paid. Is it in-kind payment whereby the influencer will get products or as a cash payment. Whichever method of payment you choose, this will need to be included in the agreement. And then last but not least, you can find that the relationship between the influencer and the company may become close. And so the influencer may come to know confidential information about the company. As such, it is important to include a confidentiality clause within the agreement which covers the company's business affairs and perhaps any new business or product ideas. The point that Syra mentioned about parties having clarity on what's expected of them is something that I think is really important. And I agree that having this documented in a contract can be helpful to brands, but it can also be helpful to influencers. Having these contracts in place is often mutually beneficial as it can give the influencer comfort about the value of the deal and the value of their image rights. For brands, it's so important to make sure that they have an agreement in place with anyone creating content, which confirms that the brand owns or licenses the rights to the image that it uses. This will give the brand freedom to use the image as it pleases if the contract has been well drafted and well negotiated. As we were saying earlier, the default position for employees which is often repeated in employment contracts, is that designs made or images taken by an employee during the course of their employment belong to the employer. So the company you work for might well own images that your team have taken to promote your brand, or the company might license the rights to use images taken by a third party photographer, for example, at promotional photo shoots. From a brand management perspective, the images and texts from websites are most easily and most commonly copied. For websites, there is probably literary copyright in the text and artistic copyright in the layout or any images used. If a third party company has designed your website, then the contract you have with them probably covers who owns the copyright in the design of the website. But the text and images used on the website, if you drafted the text yourself and took photographs, more likely belong to you. Because images can be so easily copied and pasted across different sources, it's not difficult to find yourself in a situation where you've infringed the copyright in someone else's photos. It can be tempting to use the internet to search for images to add colour to a website or to screenshot images posted by others so that you can promote your products on your own website or social media accounts. But without a licence to do that, you could end up subject to a copyright infringement claim. Copying an image is so easily done, especially because of reshare and repost buttons on social media platforms. And it's also worth bearing in mind that if an image is posted online, then any comment that accompanies the photo might be a literary work for copyright purposes. So brands should also be careful and ask for permission if they're considering using an influencer's caption alongside any image. And why is it you think that photos are so problematic? I think it's because there's no requirement for registration of copyright and it's granted automatically when the work's been created, so long as that work is original. Um, there's a high risk that you're infringing someone's copyright if you use their photo on your website or social media platforms, which can be tempting if it's a great photo and your product's in it. But of course, that all depends on whether copyright actually exists in the photograph. In the UK, a very low degree of originality in a photo will suffice. So as a result, virtually any photograph can be protected. 
but copyright law has struggled with the concept of photography for a long time. And it's really important to understand it from a brand management perspective, especially now that advertising via relationships with influencers is commonplace. There can be considerable value in an image used, for example, in an advertising campaign. If you think about Nike's Just Do It campaign, Calvin Klein's Jeans campaigns in the 90s, or the Got Milk campaign in the US, the images that promoted those campaigns alongside the slogans and the slogans, slogans in two of those examples would have been worth a lot of money to the brands that own them. And so it's important to understand who owns the image and the owner of copyright isn't necessarily the person who wrote the lyrics or the script, the model, actor or influencer in the image, or the person who pressed the shutter button on camera, but it's the person who provided the skill and labour that enabled the work to take on its final form. So the owner of the copyright in a video would arguably be the director or the producer rather than the videographer or the person being filmed. And I think that illustrates why it's important that everyone involved in brand or marketing campaigns understands who owns what rights. Syrah, how do you think brands can best manage that? Um, I think by ensuring that they have the, the um, agreements in place before they start work on any, on them, any sort of campaign. So by taking, steps, by taking steps to ensure that copyright ownership is covered and contracts read to that commission, they can then be, be in a position to best manage the issue of who owns the rights to copyright. You may find that if you've used an influencer in a campaign that they may want to be able to use the image on their own, on their own then like social media platforms too. And so it's important to bear this in mind when you're drafting for the rights of both parties. If you ignore the rights of the influencer, you run the risk of potentially damaging the relationship between the brand and that influencer. I think it's also important to remember that you can still infringe someone's copyright, even if you're not screenshotting or resharing their image. There are six economic copyrights under the uh, Copyrights, Designs and Patents Act 1988. Um, and those broadly are copying, issuing copies of the work to the public, renting or lending the work to the public, performing, showing or playing the work in public, communicating the work to the public and making an adaptation of the work. So someone doesn't have, if someone doesn't have a license to do these things and does them anyway, then they're arguably uh, committing copyright infringement. And you'd also be infringing copyright if you authorise someone to do those things without the right to do so. Um, for example, if an influencer approached your brand and asked to repost an image from one of your online platforms, um, but your company had only licensed that image from someone else who was the copyright owner for a specific purpose, you could find yourself being liable for infringement. The key point here is to think about the, the scope um, and of infringement, and it is very wide. It's crucial that you, um, if you intend to make use of the work um, that's potentially protected by copyright, then you're approaching the owner for permission because failing to do so can quite often prove costly, both in terms of the time that's taken to rectify the issue, um, also in monetary terms and, and finally in, in reputational terms as well. And if you think someone is infringing your copyright and you've had legal advice confirming that you have a valid claim, then ultimately you could raise a court action against that person. But usually you'd expect there to be some dialogue between the parties before it escalates to that stage. It's important to consider the appropriate course of action with one eye to your relationship with the infringer. And if you work with someone and they promote your products, you probably won't want to harm your relationship with them by raising a court action against them especially because now it's so easy to infringe copyright that someone can do it accidentally without understanding the potential consequences. And it can look bad if a brand is taking a really firm stance where someone's made a genuine mistake. The risk of that happening is heightened when you're working with influence, influencers or individuals who might not have their own lawyer to advise them on those issues. That's more common now that anyone can create content and post it online and anyone can build a following to become an influencer, which can happen really quickly for some people. And now more brands than ever are using online platforms to promote their products and services. Commissioning photo shoots with models to be plastered on billboards and in magazine spreads has evolved into using images taken by influencers on smartphones and online brand campaigns that are often run by internal marketing and communications teams. 
And do you think that the use of smartphones can also create risks for brands? Yeah, I do, especially because if you're looking at posts online on a smartphone or on a tablet, you can easily take screenshots and you're given the option to repost other people's images on Instagram or to share videos on TikTok. So reposting is really easy. All you need to do is tap on your screen a few times, but there are no health warnings before you do that unless you've read the small print and you're only asked to read the small print when you create your account. As we were saying earlier, it might seem trivial if you're reposting images on a personal account with friends and family, but from a brand management perspective, it could lead to disputes with your brand partners, influencers, and your wider online communities if you're not doing this with care. Even if you are reposting and giving that person credit for taking the image, you would still be infringing their copyright if they didn't give you permission to repost. And the same rule applies if you found the image posted by a third party. The fact that the copyright owner is given permission to somebody else doesn't automatically entitle you to repost the image. Equally, if you reuse a recording artist's music on a post online, you're at risk of infringing their copyright and could be the next recipient of a cease and desist letter from the solicitor. It's always best to seek permission and make sure you have a clear acceptance before reposting, either on stories that disappear or on a post on a profile that will remain on that online platform. And I think it's also worth bearing in mind that if um, you can still infringe copyright, even if you modify the image or you um, or music before you're reposting. So, for example, cropping or cutting parts from the work that you use, there are some permitted acts uh, where a work can be used either without a license or subject to statutory terms and conditions. And in the UK, that means things like making temporary copies and using copyrighted materials for a non-commercial purpose which can include things like private study or criticism or review, um, quoting from copyrighted works and creating parody, caricature or pastiche of a copyrighted work. So the European Court of Justice has issued guidance on the characteristics of parody in the Deckman and Vanderstein case, in which they confirmed that a parody will evoke an existing work while being, and they say, noticeably different from it. Um, and it needs to convey an expression of humour or mockery, which is obviously highly subjective. Um, our colleague John wrote an article recently about uh, Only Fools and Horses case, um, which may, uh, and in that case, Shazam Productions, um, who were the family company of the scriptwriter behind Only Fools and Horses and the creator of the character Del Boy, raised an action for copyright infringement against the creators of an interactive show called Only Fools, the Cushti Dining Experience. Um, the defendants sought to rely on the parody or pastiche exception to copyright infringement. The show featured the main characters from the sitcom and it incorporates their appearance, mannerisms and catchphrases, as well as their backstories and relationships with one another. And ultimately, the court found that there was not enough distance between the show and the original work for it to fall within that parody or pastiche exception. Most of the exceptions relate to non-commercial use of copyrighted works, so they're usually not applicable to brands uh, that are using the works for commercial purposes, but the parody, caricature and pastiche exceptions can nevertheless have an impact on your brand because it does allow third parties to parody it um, so as to either mock or undermine the product, which can in itself be damaging. Although, I guess, depending on the content of the parody, there could be other avenues available um, in which to challenge that work, like defamation or trademark infringement, if your brand has that protection. So, I guess, moving on to that uh, reputation management piece, how would you recommend that someone approaching, um, how, would you, sorry, how would you recommend approaching someone if you've uh, seen that they're using your image or your text on their own platforms, Carly? Well, we'd always suggest thinking about your relationship with that person, both now but also in the future, as well as thinking about whether their comments on your product or service were in promotion of your brand. If it's a well-known influencer, you might want to promote your products anyway with them, and it's worth thinking about how you can use that opportunity to approach them in a constructive way to make the most of the situation, rather than damage what could be a lucrative relationship for both parties in the future. And the damage that could be caused simply because that person stops posting about your products or posts about a competitor product instead could be significant. 
On the other hand, if your brand is the infringer, the impact reposting images can have on your brand varies depending on a number of factors, which include the content of the post that person has made, the attitude of the person you've reposted from, how they approach it and how you react. For example, an influencer with a small following who doesn't have many brand partnerships or endorsements might be flattered if you reshare their image, even if you've done it without their consent. It could increase their reach, result in a growth for their following and ultimately benefit them. But they could take action for copyright infringement later down the line if you didn't get their consent. The person whose copyright has been infringed would have six years from the date of infringement to bring an action in England and Wales. And they would have five years in Scotland from the date that they became aware of the infringement. During that time, their circumstances could change. They could become more litigious than they were previously because of a growth in their following. They might have new brand relationships, agents, representatives or advisors who are alerting them to copyright infringement that they might not be, have been aware of before. And they could also have solicitors advising them on brand deals to alert them to previous infringement. And the point here is really that although you might feel comfortable to repost images belonging to influencers that align with your brand, and although they might seem content with it at the time, you should always seek explicit content as you never know how the circumstances might change in the future. The implications of reposting and facing backlash go beyond that individual. If their followers are largely your target demographic and the influencer is well respected in their online community, it will be really important for your brand to maintain a good relationship with that person, whether the relationship is governed by an agreement or not. And that in itself is a good reason to respect the copyright that person has in their images and to seek consent from them before you repost. We have talked about this throughout our discussion today, but it's really important to remember that the owner of copyright in a work has the exclusive right to use it, copy it, or to communicate it to the public. This means that they have the right to control how the work is used and grant any licenses to any party who wishes to make use of the work, potentially for a fee. If you don't have um, a, like, um, an agreement in place and don't get any consent to repost, there's a real risk that the image owner will take it seriously if you use their images. This is particularly, this is particularly risky if that person has, has um, been um, agreements in place with other competitor brands. Um, okay, so I think what we're going to do is open the floor to questions. Um, so if you do have any other questions, feel free to stick them in the Q&A box now. There's been a few come in, so I'm just going to start with the first one, um, which is how does the ASA sanction you and does it matter that they can't fine you? Um, so I think it's right that the ASA can't fine you um, and there are ongoing consultations about that. There's a DCMS um, consultation out which is proposing giving the ASA those powers. Um, at the moment, they can't find you, and we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier, the, um, the, stat, the um, list that they have for non-compliant social media users. So there's a reputational risk for the influencer um, that uh, is posting uh, non-compliant adverts. Um, the other risk, as I see it, is one of um, just really the, the risk of escalation. So for example, the uh, ASA have confirmed in relation to the non-compliant social media list, that if they do think that there are um, repeat offenders, then what they will be tempted to do is refer that matter to either trading standards or to the CMA. And both of them have quite um, substantial powers that they can take to enforce in the context of, of uh, non-compliant adverts. So whilst the ASA itself at the moment doesn't have any um, direct power to, to find, there is the opportunity the option that they have to escalate that in certain circumstances. They have indicated that they've not done that yet, um, but I think there is definitely a, a willingness to, to move to that. And um, the other thing to obviously bear in mind, and I think the recent Kim Kardashian example is a really good one, is that this doesn't always need to come directly through the ASA. And so Kim Kardashian was fined by the SEC, which is the, the US equivalent of the Financial Conduct Authority. And so you could have situations where it's not necessarily the ASA that are stepping in to take action. It could well be something to do with the, uh, the, the wider regulatory piece. And again, those sanctions can be quite significant. So that's important for thinking about when you're talking about the guidance that you're issuing to, uh, to any influencers that you're working with. Um, second question, I think I'm going to 
ask Carly, um, which is what happens if the influencer breaches the contract? I think in those circumstances, you would have a breach of contract claim like any other breach of contract claim. But I think something to bear in mind with this is that the relationships are maybe different um, because in these circumstances, you probably want to maintain a good relationship to make sure that you can I suppose not deter their following from purchasing your products in future. So in the first instance, I think it would probably be a communication between the brand and the influencer to try and sort things out to make sure that they understand why that's occurred and then try and encourage a discussion um, between the parties so that you can try and reach a conclusion that everybody's happy with. Um, and then if, they, if it's kind of breach that you feel is really severe, then you could of course take that further. But in the first instance, I think trying to encourage discussion to understand what's happened and how you can resolve it in a way that everyone's happy with would be the best thing to do. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, okay, uh, next question. Uh, Sarah, uh, how many followers do you need to be considered a celebrity? Seems like a fairly subjective question, but um, I'm gonna throw that one out to you. That's actually a really good question. Um, so quite recently, the ESA held that um, a, there was um, then an influencer who had promoted something and she had more than 30k followers and the, AS, the, the, then the ESA actually held that she was a celebrity for the purposes of the cap code. So even though in comparison to then the other social media users and content creators and all these then the influencers, her, her, her then the number of followers, it was still like relatively low, it was 30,000, um, but the cat code, um, um, but the ESA rather, they held that she was still then, um, she was still held to be um, a celebrity. So therefore, I think this is quite important for brands to bear this in mind that even if the influencer has a relatively low social media following, this may still trigger the rules on the use of any celebrity. And it's important that brands are aware of this because there are more restrictions around what a celebrity can and can't do with regards to promoting brands and products. Okay. Um... Next question. Um, appreciate there's always a legal risk in resharing images without permission, but isn't the commercial risk low if that image has gone viral and there's no evidence of the co subject copyright owner ever enforcing the rights? Um, I think that's a fair question, and I think it probably demonstrates the, um, I suppose, the, the sliding scale that exists in this type of issue. Um, where there's no evidence of them enforcing the rights, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to enforce the rights. And I think that it probably feeds into a separate question, which is how long does copyright last from the creation of the work? Films, for instance, over time end up in the public domain. And that's right. Um, but I think, as Carly mentioned, uh, for the author of uh, for author works, um, the, the copyright period is tied to the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. And so while the risk might be low, you could find a situation where you end up um, living with that risk for quite a long period of time. Um, and I don't think it's a case of them necessarily having waived the rights. One of the issues that you find uh, quite frequently is that people just aren't aware that those images are being used in that way. Um, and so what you could find is um, at a later stage them coming back to basically try to enforce those rights retrospectively. And, and that can be a real challenge. So appreciate that it's it's always a bit of a, a commercial view um and probably in a sort of typical lawyer fashion we would say well the best thing to do is always to try to seek the permission of the uh, copyright owner before um using that particularly for commercial purposes because when you start to use it for commercial purposes that's where you can start to stray into the territory of quite substantial um damages uh, for example we haven't really got into it today, but quantifying damages and what a reasonable license fee would be for the, the, the type of um, campaign that's being run, you can find that quite quickly that gets into quite uh, substantial figures. And so it's, it's always something to, to bear in mind. I think I'm just looking at the time, we've only got five minutes left. So I think what we'll probably do is that there are a couple of other 
questions, but we'll maybe just pick them up directly with those that have asked them after the webinar today. So um, I'll deal with that later. Um, just to wrap up, I guess, um, Syrah, Carly, probably starting with Carly, if you can um, give us your main takeaways from the conversation today, what would they be? For me, I think it's that copyright can give you an additional layer of protection that can be really useful for your brand especially because of the breadth and length of that protection, as you've just mentioned, Matt. But that means that you need to be absolutely certain about what your rights are. Because influencers and content creators are now becoming central to marketing strategies, it's fundamental that brands and influencers understand the ways that the law creates parameters around their relationships and how they can ensure that they're getting what they need from those relationships. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think the main takeaway from a contractual point of view is being aware that a influencer agreement is different from a standard commercial agreement. It's important that the influencer agreement contains key provisions which ensure that the company is protecting its rights and its brand when it is engaging with any influencer. Great. I think um, the, the really interesting thing about this area is that there are a huge number of legal issues that come out from brand management online, and we don't have time to cover them all today. Um, I, I guess my personal favourite is um, being asked whether or not someone liking a post or liking a request to uh, use an image constituted agreement. Um, and we've also had examples where it's been you know, thumbs up emoji, what does that mean in a legal context? And I don't really think you see that anywhere else. So um, it's quite an interesting and, and fast moving area. And it's definitely something where I think there's going to be a lot of um, progress and development over the next few years. Um, we're going to continue with this series and we're going to be looking at some of the other issues that arise from um, online brand management. Um, our colleagues, Rudy Leishman and John McKenzie, are going to be talking about the legal grounds to challenge or complain about online content that's objectionable. Um, also looking at some of the uh, content and regulating fraudulent advertising online and how best to deal with that sort of objectionable online content. That webinar is going to take place on Wednesday, the 2nd of November at 2 a.m. And so if you're not signed up for that already, you'll be sent a link to the session after uh, today's session alongside a, a recording of this webinar. So um, thanks very much to everyone for attending. Um, it's uh, hopefully been a useful discussion and hopefully you'll be able to join the next session as well. Thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone.